Welcome to uh, week three, lecture one of HIL227, HH227, Medieval Britain. Uh, it's been a few years since I've given this lecture, so uh, bear with me as we move along here. It gives me a certain type of uh, sadness as a historian, as a human being, of course, to uh, give lectures like this on topics which never seem to go away. Of course, anti-Semitism uh, is a, a part of our modern society now. Um, it's certainly illustrated in the 20th century no more terribly and dramatically than in the Holocaust. Uh, and yet, uh, uh, these aren't new ideas by any stretch of the imagination. As we look at the uh, Jewish community in medieval England today, we'll see that uh, anti-Semitism uh, stretches right the way back into the Middle Ages. Uh, and is a, a very old uh, aspect of uh, Western society, unfortunately. Uh, as I say, it's a bit troubling to have to keep retelling the story of anti-Semitism as historians do in, in different periods of time. But uh, uh, that's uh, what we're about uh, today, really. We're going to talk about the uh, position of the Jewish community in medieval England. And you'll see over the course of this lecture that that, that is a position which deteriorates across the 13th century and results ultimately with the expulsion of all Jews from England in 1290. Uh, and indeed, that's part of a wave of expulsions of Jews from nations in Western Europe. Now, this illustration on the bottom of the title slide you'll see here uh, contains individuals which you might not at first recognize as Jewish, but they are. Uh, these uh, a little, I don't know what we call them there, uh, 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 these aspects of the illustration here, where the pointer is now, these are meant to be tablets, reflecting the uh, two tablets which Moses brings down from the mountain in the Old Testament. And these are a badge uh, which uh, Jews were required to wear in public in uh, the Middle Ages in uh, England, and similar badges were used in some other places of Europe to indicate publicly that they are Jews. So if you had the idea that the Nazis were the ones to invent the idea of forcing Jews to wear a marker on the outside of their clothing. Uh, sadly, that's uh, wrong. This is something. There is a, a Jewish community, indeed a Jewish identity in medieval England. Uh, a Jewish identity, I mean, if we, we sum this up in a very broad way, encompasses shared religious beliefs uh, in, in encompasses their own language. Uh, the language of Jewish community in medieval England was Hebrew. Uh, there are religious buildings, there are synagogues uh, uh, and burial places, for example. What we have at the bottom of this slide here, uh, this is part of the Guild Hall of London, right in the city, excuse me, right in the center of medieval London, when they excavated under it and around it, uh, because the Guild Hall adjoined a street in medieval London called Old Jewry Street, which was uh, it was indeed the, the Jewish ghetto, if you like, medieval London. It's about 400 feet long and about 20 feet wide. Uh, when they excavated underneath the guild hall, adjoining Old Jewry Street, they found the remains of some uh, buildings which they think were probably uh, occupied by uh, medieval Jews. This might have been part of a synagogue, uh, part of this build, the uh, these stone walls here. On the right, uh, here we have a manuscript uh, held in the British Library, as per the reference here, uh, which is in Hebrew. This is a literate culture, of course, which are writing their own texts, uh, producing books, uh, circulating ideas. So this is a, you know, it's quite a vibrant living community in medieval England. Uh, we might ask, uh, you know, what can we learn from studying the Jewish uh, community in medieval England? Uh, England, or indeed in, in medieval Europe. Uh, well, for example, uh, there is a, a dis already, I mean, this is a bit of a kind of chicken and egg argument, of course, but there is already uh, an established uh, field of scholarship looking at uh, the Jews in medieval Britain and England. And this is a scholarship which tries to work out both what happened in terms of the day-to-day -day life and activities of, of Jews in medieval England, but also to try and fit the relationship between that community and the wider society of the Middle Ages into a long narrative of how uh, 
uh, Christian Western society has interacted with the Jewish community through time. Of course, anti-Semitism is one aspect of that, but there are others. Uh, Professor Patricia, Patricia Skinner, who of course is here at Swansea University, uh, has produced this volume, uh, An Introduction to the Jews, Medieval Britain, published 2003. <coughs> uh, but there are others, of course. Uh, uh, Moore's Formation of a Persecuting Society looks at this question of uh, anti-Semitism and persecution of the Jews back uh, through time, through medieval England. So at the bottom here we have a grave slab, uh, probably a grave slab for a Jewish person, uh, but that's just uh, an example of one uh, type of bit of evidence left over from the long presence of a Jew Jewish community in medieval Britain. Uh, Jews came to England, it is thought, uh, uh, possibly some before the Norman Conquest, but certainly many more in the wake of the Norman Conquest of 1066. <coughs> they come from northern France, in particular, and settle in London and the southeast, and then spread to other key communities, particularly urban communities su such as York in the northeast. Uh, in the Middle Ages, the three largest uh, cities in medieval Britain were, of course, London, York, and Bristol. Uh, followed in the late Middle Ages by Norwich, and so it should come as no surprise that these are cities with Jewish uh, communities. In London, already by 1127, near St. Paul's Cathedral, uh, there is a so-called Jewish quarter, and this probably refers to the same area which would occupy the medieval street of Old Jewry near the Guildhall that I've mentioned already. Uh, there are religious texts uh, reflecting the uh, interaction between the Jewish faith and the Christian faith, uh, both uh, on a theoretical basis used for teaching in various uh, ways, but also a practical discourse on the nature of Judaism in the Middle Ages. For example, the uh, dispensation, be, dispen, uh, excuse me, disputation between a Jew and a Christian uh, is written sometime be before uh, 1093, uh, but Gilbert Crispin, and this is a uh, a kind of theoretic, probably a theoretical dialogue between a Jew and a Christian about different aspects of faith and what those mean. So th this is really the idea of the Jewish community living alongside or among the Christian community is part of the psyche of society in Britain in the Middle Ages. Now, the 12th century is seen arguably, I say arguably, that which is a sentiment represented by the little question mark here in the second line of the slide, but it's arguably been seen as a period of growth in England. There is a Jewish community at Oxford by 1141, Cambridge by 1144, Norwich by 1148, uh, or excuse me, uh, Winchester by 1148. Uh, as I say, that there's a a perceived growth and spread of the Jewish community in England. But you've got to keep in mind, and this is one of the reasons there's a little question mark here on, is this a period of genuine growth? Is it this same period across the 1100s is one in which we're first getting uh, a really substantial survival of documentary evidence? And so some historians have questioned uh, whether these are new Jewish communities in Oxford, Cambridge, Norwich, and Winchester, so much as uh, the 1140s, when we see a kind of blossoming of surviving documents, maybe it's just the first time we see those communities uh, or see evidence of them. But I think the consensus, for the most part, is that the, the 12th century is a period of growth. Uh, certainly we see not just the, the presence of Jewish persons, but Jewish persons interacting with the broader economy and money lending in particular, Cistercian abbeys, uh, such as this one pictured at the bottom of the screen here. Uh, well, I think this is up in uh, New Durham, if I recall, so I'm trying to remember exactly which abbey that is. But, but these great establishments which uh, held thousands of acres of land and, and uh, reared sheep on them, 
the Cistercian order believed in particular uh, that work was a form of praise to God. So they occupied areas which were not suitable for desirable uh, grain agriculture, but rather reared sheep. And when they needed to borrow funds to get their wool trade off the ground uh, or to engage in trade, they went to Jewish moneylenders in the 12th century. And uh, certainly by 1177 uh, is established the right of Jews to, to uh, establish cemeteries uh, in London, elsewhere in England. And so this is perceived, as I say, to be a period of growth of the Jewish community uh, in Britain. Now, the Jews are in a particular uh, type of position. By the time we get to the 12th and particularly the 13th centuries, a lot of uh, skilled trades and crafts uh, are controlled by uh, what we call craft guilds, which are associations of workers who establish monopolies over certain areas of trade. So, for example, shoemakers in a town, uh, shoemakers in Rithin in North Wales, for example, banded together to create a society of corvisers and shoemakers. Now, uh, these had certain sort of benefits. These uh, societies would, uh, uh, you know, pay dues and look after their own when they were ill or pay funerary expenses. But these kind of monopolies often are intimately intertwined with aspects of the Christian faith. They're dedicated to a saint. And this type of structure, uh, trade structure, uh, is very difficult to penetrate by non-Christians. And this might perhaps be one of the key reasons why uh, Jews end up very often acting as money lenders in medieval England. This is perceived to be a particular area uh, which is almost kind of carved out in law as being suitable for Jewish persons in a medieval mind. Now, one of the reasons for this, of course, is in medieval Christian uh, ideology, it was illegal to lend money or it was immoral, and a sin, in fact, to lend money at interest. Now, money does get lent uh, but not at interest. People would say, for example, I lend you some money, uh, you know, and you pay me back the same money, but I expect a little gift when you give it back. There are ways around uh, the prohibition in law of lending money at interest if you were a Christian, but if you were a Jew, it was uh, accepted that you could lend money at interest, and so that, that helps to kind of, that and the sort of impenetrability of Christian-dominated trade structures and other areas of work kind of channels the Jewish community into a money lending uh, role in society. Uh, for example, uh, one of the uh, best known money lenders in medieval England is uh, Aaron of Lincoln, uh, because we have a, an assessment of, of everything he, he possessed, all the debts owed to him uh, in the 12th century. It's a rare document survival, really, but uh, he had uh, 430 clients' uh, uh, connections across uh, 25 countries, including the, the kings of Scotland and England. Uh, you know, he's really an extraordinary individual as a moneylender. He's effectively a banker more than a moneylender. Uh, a special exchequer of the Jews is set up in London uh, in the 13th century to handle disputes regarding uh, Jewish persons. Uh, now, this handles both disputes between Jews, but also disputes with Jews. And, of course, those most often arise from their money lending activities. Effectively, the Jewish community become the bankers of medieval England. In the 13th century, uh, perhaps one-seventh of the English crown's income would come from taxing uh, the Jewish community uh, and from various fines uh, uh, collected through the exchequer of the Jews, for example. So effectively, we have the banking sector, and then the crown recognizes the importance of that and tries to cream off profits of the banking sector by taxing the Jews. Here now in the bottom right of the screen, you'll see a medieval illustration of some uh, Jewish moneylenders. Here's a stereotyped hat, which was associated with uh, Jews in the Middle Ages, counting out some coins on a table down here. How were the Jews treated? Uh, well, very poorly, uh, not surprisingly. 
uh, given the emphasis on Christian faith in 12th and 13th century uh, Britain. Uh, of course, uh, even persons with a rudimentary knowledge of the Bible in the Middle Ages were familiar with the uh, story of the uh, crucifixion of Christ and the idea that the uh, Jewish officials were behind that crucifixion. Therefore, Jews are responsible for the uh, you know, the crucifixion of, of Christ. And, and so that, that idea is one which even the kind of most lowly of peasant w would know. And, and so these people view, uh, or at least are predisposed as a result of the message you're receiving in church, to view the Jewish community negatively. Well, in the later 12th century, we perceive there to be a decline in the position of the Jewish community, Possibly, I mean, you know, jealousy at the relative wealth of people who have been channeled into a position of being money lenders, which is a, a lucrative type of work, is one aspect. Uh, increasing religiosity, perhaps among ordinary Christians, medieval uh, England, with a, a bit of an anti Semitic bent to the teachings of receiving a church, might be another. And there are a whole series of, uh, of pogroms uh, against. Uh, Programs against Jews in medieval England. Uh, probably the most, uh, well, I mean, in 1290, there are, following the coronation of Richard I in uh, 1189, uh, which is seen as a great, a great kind of celebration. Of course, Richard would go on to be a, a crusader against non Christians in the Middle East, Richard the Lionheart. Lionheart. Uh, but corresponding with that, sort of change of guard when uh, Richard becomes king, we see a whole series of, of persecutions uh, in 1190 in King's Lynn, and Norwich, uh, Stamford, Bury St. Edmunds, Lincoln, maybe the most notable is uh, York in 1190. Uh, if you've been to York, you know that York is situated within a Roman wall, uh, which is topped up by medieval defenses, and in the middle of uh, medieval York, uh, is this Mott and Bailey put up the, by the Normans. Uh, here's your kind of mott here, and on top of which is a stone keep. And this is a site of a particularly uh, terrible massacre. About 150 Jewish persons were murdered in York. Uh, here's a placard which exists now to mark it, uh, telling you a bit about the event. On Friday the 16th March 1190, 150 uh, Jews and Jewesses of York having sought protection in the royal castle on this site from a mob incited uh, by a man named uh, Richard uh, Malbus and others, uh, chose to die in each other's hands rather than renounce their faith. Uh, uh, so the, a pogrom begins at the behest of uh, uh, you know, the anti-Semitic uh, pre preachings of uh, this individual, Richard uh, Malbus. The, the mob chases the Jews of York uh, you know, really to this castle because they, they, they're they seeking their royal protection, uh, you know, from a murderous mob, really, and they're told to kind of come out and, and face conversion. They don't, uh, they're not willing to submit to uh, forceful conversion, and ultimately they're massacred the site. It's dreadful, really. Now, uh, when bad King John, so-called, uh, Exceeds to the throne from his brother Richard, he initiates what's been called the sort of general captivity of the Jews. What, what really happens here is uh, John, beginning in uh, 1267, uh, he decides he's going to try and tax the Jewish community in England very heavily. Uh, what he does is he uh, uh, forces all Jews in England to, to produce an account of all of the debts owed to them. He then says that he is going to uh, uh, that he is going to be take over as creditor for ten percent or one tenth of all of those debts. So in that way, he effectively taxes the Jewish community because Jews have lent money to someone. Say, if a, a Jewish moneylender has lent money to ten people, John now says, "I am now the creditor for one of those ten loans, uh, and I will collect that debt." In addition. Uh, in addition to that, uh, John says that he has the right to purchase <coughs> any of the other debts that are owed uh, 
uh, to a Jewish moneylender. So, for example, if a, a noble owed money to a, a Jew, John would say, I can see that noble X owes 10 pounds to Jew Y. I am going to pay Jew Y 10 pounds to become the creditor. So I now own that debt. And that gives John leverage over certain individuals. It also puts him in a, in a position uh, to effectively collect uh, any interest on that. So kind of an end around of the prohibition against uh, interest, or could be seen that way at least. Uh, John realizes here you know, how much money is to be made by taxing the Jewish community. Now, uh, John, uh, while he collects this remarkable uh, value uh, in funds from the Jewish community, 60,000 marks uh, is about 40,000 pounds, many, many times the annual income of the Crown's own estates. Uh, things do get better after John, or they're perceived to get better. Uh, when John dies, uh, Henry III uh, becomes king, but Henry's just a, a, a wee child, and so for a very long time the, the country's governed in his name, and there are no real uh, potent royal abuses. It's estimated that in 1241, or by 1241, uh, about one-third of all coinage in England is directly or indirectly through uh, indebtedness uh, in the possession of the Jewish community, which is quite a, a remarkable sum. And you can see, of course, in that why uh, John had wanted to tax them uh, 30 years before. Uh, So-called new men emerge in the Jewish community in the first half of the 13th century. So we see rabbis, physicians, uh, we see Jewish scholarship, Jewish books, synagogues, uh, cemeteries, uh, 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 slaughterhouses, uh, ovens, you know, things associated with a kind of growing uh, Jewish, uh, growing Jewish community. And of course, the slaughterhouses are to, to ensure that the meat is butchered uh, properly by Jewish tradition. So some would say, uh, or some have argued, that this is a, a, a period of recovery. Unfortunately, it doesn't last that long. Uh, somewhere between the 14, excuse me, 1240s and the 1260s, <coughs> we see the emergence of, of stronger and stronger anti-Semitic popular feeling. We see anti-Semitic writers, uh, the uh, commentator Matthew Paris, who lives at St. Albans, north of London, who is a real kind of uh, a gossip, effectively, is a terrible anti-Semite. Uh, he represents a certain kind of class of educated, uh, really anti-Semitic individual. Uh, Stacy, for example, has written that, that this period is a watershed in Anglo-Jewish relations, uh, you know, that sees a spiral of collapse uh, in uh, Christian Jewish relations. Uh, perhaps we can see that the kind of early roots of this back in 1239 uh, with the imprisonment of certain Jews and uh, with uh, uh, various financial records seized and put to scrutiny. Uh, in the 1240s and 50s, uh, there are tallages. Uh, and it's been estimated that throughout the 1240s and 50s, these tallages, a tallage being a form of tax, uh, effectively... Uh, take from the Jewish community half of those assets uh, which it had produced, excuse me, which it had possessed back in 1241. So if by 1241 the the Jews of medieval England had accrued a, a lot of uh, wealth, then uh, they're hit hard by a series of taxes to try and uh, take it from them. I mean, once tempted to say steal from them, but uh, uh, I guess that raises broader intellectual questions of uh, what level of taxation becomes effectively a theft. Uh, now, this leads to a spiral of collapse. Uh, of course, some Jewish moneylenders go, go uh, bankrupt. Uh, uh, I mean, we might see as representative of this whole spiral here uh, the story of Elias uh, Levesque. Uh, Levesque is an arch presbyter of the English Jewry. Uh, he's uh, effectively acts as a, as a kind of head uh, head rabbi of the, Engl of the Jewish community. He's uh, you know, born in London back in the 12th century. You know, he's a uh, you know, mature individual, reasonably late in his life by the 1250s. And, and he, uh, you know, within the London Jewish community, makes various representations to the crown 
uh, Henry the Third by the 1250s has has now become a you know a, a king in in command of his uh, own government, and he takes to taxing the Jewish community very heavily. As I mentioned just a moment ago, about a, about half of the wealth of the Jewish community in 1241 has been removed by the 1250s. In, in 1253, he makes a kind of desperate appeal. Uh, to the Royal Council to, to let the Jews of England leave the country rather than be uh, taxed more, to take their assets and go. And that, of course, is denied because uh, the Crown sees that as a big chunk of its wealth, uh, potentially leaving the country. Uh, effectively, eventually, in 1257, he's deposed from office uh, and under this kind of intense pressure, and I think he can see which way the wind is blowing uh, he and his uh, two sons eventually uh, convert to Christianity, uh, probably just to avoid uh, the kind of pogroms that he sees coming down the line. There's a notion uh, that develops across the 13th century that the Jews actually belong to the crown. Uh, for example, the 1253 Ordinance of Henry III so-called ordinance of the Jews, say openly, no Jew dwell in England unless he do service to the king. <coughs> this uh, makes Jews effectively the equivalent of sort of unfree serfs on a manor who uh, more or less uh, dwell on a manor in a countryside only to serve the landlord. It's that same feudal ideology. I give you some figures here. Uh, you know, on the amount of taxation collected, it's, it's remarkable sums in relation to the, the value of the king's own crown estates. Uh, eventually, these sums culminate in, in, in 1271, uh, the last year of, last full year of Henry III's reign, with a tax that the Jewish community just can't pay. You know, they've been driven to bankruptcy by Henry III by the end of his life. Uh, restrictions are brought in under Henry III on where Jews may live, uh, limiting contact between Christians and Jews, uh, and requiring Jews to wear these tablet-like badges on their clothing to indicate who they are. Now, this relates uh, to <coughs> excuse me. This relates to uh, moves by the papacy uh, some decades before to influence Christian kings to require these things of their Jews. So this raises the question of what are the attitudes of or ordinary persons in <coughs> medieval England or Britain? Well, that's quite hard to know, uh, as with all kind of uh, episodes of discontent or uh, pogroms against different groups. It's always the vocal minority that, that, that you hear about or hear of that leave the greatest trace in the record. We don't know much about the kind of more passive majority, what they were thinking. Certainly what we do know isn't, isn't good. Uh, whether it's religious thinkers like Matthew Paris uh, at St. Albans or it's the persons who engage in pogroms against the Jews, there's a, uh, a sense of anti-Jewish resentment. Certainly Jews are stigmatized. They're required, of course, from 1218 to wear these tablet-shaped badges, uh, tablet-shaped badges in their clothing, as here in this illustration. Uh, teachings of the church, uh, as I mentioned before, even your most ordinary peasant would know the story as taught in the Middle Ages that Christ had been effectively killed by the Jews uh, more more than the Romans because it was Jewish officials who arrested him. Uh, there are also rumors, uh, false rumors of ritual murder, and this particularly is associated with the, I mean, the, the still living anti-Semitic notion of blood libel which is this idea that Jews uh, murder children as part of various religious uh, rituals. Now this, in a roundabout way, uh, relates to the uh, uh, Jewish festival of Passover. Now, of course, in the Old Testament story of Moses and the liberation of the Jews from Egypt, there is an episode where Moses prophesizes a, a certain kind of curse against the Egyptians, whereby on a certain night the <laughs> the firstborn sons of Egyptian families will, will die. Uh, and that, that's the kind of final straw, which uh, when that happens, it convinces the uh, Egyptians to, to let the Jews uh, go uh, and leave Egypt, the so-called exodus. Well, 
uh, there is a feast of, of Passover just to celebrate that. And uh, uh, a certain kind of bread is baked uh, to celebrate uh, that festival. And it was believed in the Middle Ages uh, by some uh, that uh, uh, Christian children were kidnapped and murdered so that their blood could be baked into those uh, breads. Uh, this has a relationship in a kind of confused way with the idea uh, of those Egyptian children who were uh, uh, died in this plague uh, prophesied uh, by Moses. Now, uh, it's as a result that, of this that there are numerous uh, claims of uh, uh, blood libel or child killing against Jews. I mean, uh, uh, little Hugh of Lincoln is a uh, I mean, there's a boy named Hugh, uh, well named Hugh obviously <coughs> who disappears and is found dead so-called Hugh of Lincoln and uh, uh, the community uh, of Christians accuses the Jewish community of this now uh, this accusation that little Hugh of Lincoln was murdered. Uh, in a case of blood libel leads to a pogrom against uh, Jews in Lincoln. But in fact, that was just one episode. Uh, the uh, life of supposed St. William of Norwich, uh, who uh, supposedly had been crucified uh, by Jews in uh, Norwich back in 1144, is circulated widely uh, and becomes quite, you know, known among uh, priests. And of course, priests and clergy are those who, who tell the ordinary uh, peasants or laymen when uh, visiting church how they should believe about uh, religious uh, affairs, indeed, uh, including inter-religious uh, affairs. And so, William of Norwich's work, or excuse me, the the life of, of William of Norwich, written by uh, Thomas, a man named Thomas of Monmouth. <laughs> inspires events like the the pogrom in Lincoln uh, when little Hugh is found uh, dead there. Again, there's no real uh, evidence in any way at all that, that uh, uh, Hugh had died as a result of anything to do with the uh, Jewish community. Uh, but as a result of this kind of uh, perfect storm of uh, new circulating anti-Semitic literature like the William of Norwich story, and uh, a rising sort of consciousness of uh, Christian consciousness of, of Jewish matters uh, uh, disseminated through the church uh, and a growing Jewish community, which uh, are being, you know, effectively, they're, they're both moneylenders, which, uh, of course, people often feel a certain anxiety or a distrust of, of banks, even today, or the people they owe money to. It's easy to dislike uh, someone you owe money to, uh, you know, it all kind of comes together in episodes like the the Hugh of Lincoln uh, pogrom, and uh, more troubling yet, uh, Henry the Third, who positions himself as a very devout man, he he also recognizes or uh, the the possibility that uh, Hugh might well have been uh, murdered uh, by Jews. So, you know, again, we have the, the crown, which should be the protector of the Jewish community, which are bound to him, not uh, really standing up and doing the right thing and defending the Jewish community, but rather kind of acceding to the popular ideology uh, of the I mean, there are a lot of stereotypes of Jews. Uh, this is, a, uh, you know, an exchequer roll of 1233. In the National Archives, I just want you to see here the uh, <coughs> way in which uh, Jews are depicted here. So there's this this uh, funny shaped hat which is associated with Jews. Here you see a money lender. Here is money on scales. Uh, the Satan here is pointing to the noses of a Jewish man and a, a Jewish woman against this nasty stereotype of uh, uh, you know the, the, the Nazis push to that all Jewish people have a a big crooked uh, knows which is obviously just nasty anti-Semitism, but you can see in this, uh, you know, the, the devil is working here with, in theory, uh, you know, in the mind of the, this uh, anti-Semitic artist, the devil is working together with these people. He's pointing them out, you know, and you can see the finger here 
pointing at the scales of money. Uh, and there's more little devils here waiting to drag people away, presumably to hell. Uh, so really pretty nasty stuff. As I mentioned a couple of slides ago, uh, Henry III uh, wasn't thinking entirely on his own when he uh, begins to persecute the Jews more uh, forcefully as he gets older and takes uh, charge of his own throne in the uh, 1250s, say, because uh, there had been a, uh, a series of instructions issued by Pope Innocent III, the, the so-called Fourth Lateran Council, and these uh, papal councils are, are episodes where popes bring together uh, archbishops and bishops from around uh, the Christian world to get them to agree to a kind of a, a single party line on certain important issues of the day. Now, uh, Innocent III thought that the position of the Jewish community was an important issue of the day back in uh, 1215. And uh, the uh, canons, as they're called, the orders of the Fourth Lateran Council, described the Jews as a, a dangerous contagion uh, and the Pope orders, among other things, that Jews ought across Europe to wear these tablet-shaped badges when in public so people know they're Jews. Uh, there are also a number of other things in the Canons of Fourth Lateran Council, for example, that, that Jews ought not act as wet nurses to Christian children. It's that idea of contamination, again, that somehow breast milk might carry this, this contagion of Judaism from a Jewish person to a Christian person. Uh, Jews are commanded to or to worship only quietly in private where Christians can't see. Uh, so there's a real attempt there to kind of separate separate the Jewish community. Uh, but it's only really Henry the Third, you know, uh, decades later, who decides to import these canons of the Fourth Lateran Council to England and to put them into effect, requiring the the Jews to wear these badges in their clothing, for example. This is part of Henry III's uh, strategy of ruling in England. He's not a warlike man. In fact, he, he faces civil war at one point from his own barons, we'll come back to. Uh, and so he, he paints himself as a religious leader, you know, that uh, he's doing God's work by leading England. In fact, he starts construction of Westminster Abbey. Now, uh, the church goes further than this uh, later in 1286. Uh, which would be in the, the reign of Henry III's son, Edward I, in England, uh, the Pope orders the confiscation of the Talmud, where it can be found across Europe. Uh, and there are also uh, various edicts uh, expounding the importance of, of, of getting Jews to convert. Uh, Henry III runs a, a program of uh, attempting to make Jewish persons or uh, to induce Jewish persons to convert to Christianity uh, in the latter part of his reign, although the numbers who do convert are, are small. <coughs> now, as I said, Henry III, he, he suffers all kinds of domestic trouble at home. Uh, Simon de Montfort is the leader of a faction of, of English barons who rebel against Henry uh, in 1263 to 64. And they have various uh, uh, debts uh, to the Jewish community. They're they take an anti-Semitic line. They try and associate Henry III's uh, uh, sort of management of the Jewish community and his taxation of them under this ideal that uh, all Jews work directly or indirectly for the king. He tries to associate Henry III with, with the Jewish community and in opposition to that and knowing that he owes various debts, he and his supporters attack Jews and Jewish property. Uh, one might say in a kind of real politic way that he's attack attacking an important part of the king's tax base. Uh, but there's more to it than that, one thinks. Something more sinister and anti-Semitic. Sources of the time indicate uh, and emphasize, indeed, efforts by de Montfort and his men to destroy uh, records of loans uh, and various chests in the possession of Jewish uh, moneylenders. So what about Henry III's son, Edward I? Well, he's a chap who ultimately expels all Jews from England. In 1275, uh, 
excuse me, in 1275, Edward's uh, uh, mother, Eleanor Provence, uh, the widow of the late King Henry III, she seeks permission from her son, the new King Edward I, uh, to prohibit Jews from living in any of the towns within her uh, territory. And, of course, as the, the widow of the late king, she holds uh, about a third of the late king's private estates as her so-called dower, or land to support her as widow. Now, Edward I accedes to this, this uh, request, and it, it indicates something about uh, her own feelings about the Jewish community. Clearly, she was very anti-Semitic. Perhaps she had influenced... Henry the, some of Henry III's efforts to force conversion on the Jews uh, and to bring in various restrictions on their daily lives, you know, to force the wearing of the tablets and so forth. Uh, it's also been suggested that Eleanor of Provence might have influenced her son, Edward I, to take a, a, more, a more firm anti-Semitic line. Uh, and so... Uh, following uh, her own sort of uh, request here, we get the, the sta so-called statute uh, of Jewry in 1275, issued by Edward I. And the statute of the Jewry, it bans Jews from money, lending money at interest. Now, that's a bit kind of bizarre, really, because the Crown had been relying upon the Jewish community as people who were allowed to charge interest and profit from making loans as a, a major source of tax revenue. Uh, and indeed, the Jewish community had been kind of channeled into occupying that specific role in the economy uh, over the better part of a century. So what do you do now that uh, uh, you know Jews are no longer re allowed to lend money at interest? Well, they find, try and find different ways uh, of uh, acting as bankers uh, more in keeping with the rules governing Christian money lending. For example, sorry, for example, uh, you know, you might invest uh, in a venture, say a shipping venture, and then take part of the return. But that's something quite different from uh, the sort of straightforward lending of of money as it occurred before. Uh, and indeed, it's not really possible to sort of suddenly change the entire sort of structure of, of the Jewish community's sort of uh, economy. And of course, Edward also ramps up these anti-Jewish provi provisions. Uh, he affirms in by statute the, the rule that the yellow badges in the shape of Moses' tablets be wearing outer clothing, that they be at least six inches by three inches in size. The Jews from the age of 12 have to pay a special tax. Uh, Christians are now forbidden from living among Jews. Uh, Jews are all liable to, to pay three pence a year. Uh, debtors of Jews were no longer liable to repay certain debts. Uh, so this is really devastating uh, to the Jewish uh, community. <clears throat> but at the same time, the crown, of course, uh, retains the right to tax the Jews. Now, this leads to the, the kind of impoverishment of the Jewish community, and obviously some people choose to ignore this uh, statute uh, and carry on lending money anyway, probably out of desperation of what else are they going to do. But remember, as I mentioned before, that kind of craft and trade communities are very much closed communities controlled by guilds by this period, uh, and those are, are Christian guild uh, communities. In 1278, uh, Jews are accused of uh, filing the ed edges off of silver pennies, or, or I should say clipping uh, the edges off of silver pennies. The idea here is that uh, it's quite a common practice in the Middle Ages, not necessarily among uh, Jewish persons, but by all traders, that uh, if you take a silver penny and each one that passes through your hands, you trim just a little bit off the edge, then by the end of a, a month or a, a year of trading, you've actually amassed quite a nice little pile of silver. But of course, this uh, then leads to inflation because most of the coins in circulation are clipped and not worth as much as they're supposed to be worth in terms of the metal in the coin. Now, uh, these accusations uh, that the Jews in particular are engaging in the uh, clipping of coins to amass uh, silver uh, to the detriment of the crown and the currency, they're probably mostly anti-Semitic uh, you know, in their nature, you think here about the kind of association 
in the the minds of anti-Semitic persons, well, indeed, in the in the minds of all persons, the association between Jews and money or money lending, are uh, created, of course, by the fact that for a century the Jewish community had been channeled into that sector of the economy, and you can see why this uh, accusation might burble up to the top. Now the Crown makes a show of taking these accusations very seriously. Uh, 269 uh, Jewish uh, persons are hung, uh, you know, in response to accusations of coin clipping. So it's a, a really a dreadful a pogrom. We've gone from Henry the uh, acknowledging, as he would have might have thought of it, acknowledging the possibility of blood libel and looking the other way when pogroms happen, say following the Hugh of Lincoln incident. We've gone from that position to the crown actively engaging in a pogrom against the Jewish community uh, in 1278. And now in, in late uh, 1289, Edward finally issues a uh, order for the expulsion of Jews from England, 1290, uh, whereby all Jews are meant to leave the kingdom by a certain uh, day. Now this uh, so-called edict of expulsion uh, it represents a whole bunch of things that are going on all at once here. Edward I is, is broke, basically, by this time. Uh, you know, he's had his wars uh, in Wales, for example. He's tried to build all those castles there. He's, he's had to deal with conflict in Gascony. Uh, and you can kind of see where he's headed with this. He knows that the Jews possess a lot, a lot of capital still and that debts are still owed to Jews from a time before uh, money lending uh for interest was banned. And uh, maybe the first step he takes <coughs> towards the expulsion of Jews from England is over in the Crown's possession of Gascony, the so-called Duchy of Gascony. Uh, in 1287, he orders uh, local Jews to be expelled. All of their properties taken uh, and all of the debts owed to the Jews go to the Crown. They're transferred to the king's name. This is a little bit reminiscent of back in King John's reign in 1207 when he'd said that one in ten debts owed to Jews now belonged, uh, now were owed to the king. But Edward, uh, he goes full out effectively and he expels Jews from Gascony in 1287. Now he gets back to, to England from uh, France in, in 1289. Uh, again, he's still he's deeply in debt. Uh, and we think that in 1289 he formulates the so-called uh, order of expulsion, which is uh, edict of expulsion, which is put into effect in uh, uh, July of 1290. Now, uh, Edward, you know, he is a religious man. He had suffered a serious illness in 1286. Does that affect his kind of religious fervor? Uh, we don't know. He had been on crusade against uh, non against the Muslims, of course. Uh, prior to becoming king uh, in uh, the early uh, uh, early 1270s, he becomes king in 1272. He's actually abroad on crusade uh, when his father had died. So there there are different things you know at play here. Uh, but you know he looks after himself. When the Jews are expelled from England in 1290, he does the same thing he did in in Aquitaine. He says. Going forward, all debts owed to Jews are now owed to me. And so, in a way, he's he's trying to clear some of his debts. He's putting on a show of being a good Christian by being a uh, heavy-duty anti-Semite. Uh, you know, and he, he thinks he can solve some of his problems in one fell swoop here. Of course, uh, of course in terms of taxation, he, he's killing the goose that lays the golden egg. And after the... Jews are expelled, Edward has no choice but to find another form of revenue because he can't tax England fast enough uh, to deal with his wars in Scotland, for example, coming up. So he has to turn to Italian merchant bankers <coughs> who he borrows vast sums from in exchange for promises to let them collect certain taxes in England, such as wool exports. Uh, and of course, those banking families go bust, as we'll cover in a later lecture. Now, uh, Roth, who you'll find in the reading list for module, 
he, he refers to this as the lowest depth of misery and degradation, uh, this uh, moment of expulsion. Uh, and it really is a kind of shocking, uh, shocking turn. Now, most of the uh, most of the Jews who leave England go to the uh, south of France. Some go to the Netherlands. Uh, and indeed, some probably uh, went went to places further uh, further east, perhaps the Holy Roman Empire or indeed Poland. So, uh, we don't know uh, with great certainty.